Minimize the negative effects of alcohol consumption. Do this. Don't drink too late. If your alcohol consumption disrupts your sleep, you're gonna get way more negative effects. Number two, drink a lot of water, but also electrolytes. The electrolytes, especially sodium, helps you hang on to that water so you don't get that dehydrated, hungover feeling. Number three, go low sugar. Eat less calories or drink less calories with your alcohol. And oftentimes sugar combined with alcohol just also gives you an upset stomach. Number four, pace yourself. Don't drink too fast. That makes the alcohol concentration in your blood go up too fast. Then before you know it, you're past the point of having fun. And finally, the last one, use Z-Biotics. It has been shown and proven to reduce the negative effects that vasitaldehyde that happens from alcohol consumption. Those are the things you can do to minimize the negative effects of alcohol. Those are all good. This was literally my recipe for Thanksgiving. Was it really? Uh, yeah. This was the Christmas party deal. So oh, uh, yeah. at the beginning of the Christmas party or the entrance, right, to get in, uh, aside from checking in. Was drinking the, the Z-Biotics. Yeah, it was the Z-Biotics. And my favorite is to hear back from and report, uh, the people that reported back that had never tried it before. And I remember, what is this? I said, just drink it and then tell me how you feel. Like next way day. better. Oh, yeah. No, no, way better. Always. Yeah. So before we get into that, like, like the not drinking too late was the bit, like a huge one that I learned as I got older. Cause you know, when I was younger mm -hmm. and you'd go drink, it was always late at night. I was always late at night. It's past 10 PM. Yeah. Then you're up you all night. You just don't want to stop. You're you, just, oh, I'm having so much fun. Yeah. And then, then you're up, you know, at night. you can't sleep or even if you do, it's terrible <laughs> sleep. So now you have a combination of like lack of sleep plus the negative effects of alcohol. You just feel terrible. And I remember when I got older, the first time I did day drinking. You know, where you go out and it's like, you know, kind of like Vegas, new or whatever, and you yeah, hang out. Party. And then then you stop drinking at a certain time and then you get tired and you go to sleep and you wake up the next day. I remember being like, what? Why didn't anybody ever tell me about this? This is like such a big deal. Yeah. Um, water with electrolytes is, of course, uh, a big one. I used to do coconut water back in the day uh, before, you know, we worked with- uh, Glad you finished that. Element T. I started to say Coke and then- Coconut, coconut water. Good. Yeah. Not mm. Coke and water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adam said Vegas. So. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Um, It brought me there. But yeah, the z -Biotics is pretty crazy. A lot of people don't know how we actually started working with them. It's a really funny story. I brought up an article. This author wrote about this like breakthrough product where they took bacteria, modified it, genetically modified it so that the bacteria itself would break down- acetaldehyde, which the acetaldehyde is a negative byproduct of alcohol. Your liver breaks it down, but some of it comes out in the gut. So before your liver can break it down, it still it gets to your bloodstream. And the theory is that that's what gives us that like nauseous, oh, yeah, hangover-like feeling. Yeah, right? yeah. Too much mm -hmm. acetaldehyde feels like headaches, upset stomach, inflammation, irritability, all that kind of stuff. So the author in the in the article, I brought it up on, on a earlier qua a long time ago. And I said, because I read it and the guy said, oh my God, I tried it. I've tried it like five times. It's yeah. really crazy that it works. Talked about on the podcast, Z-Biotics called us like a month later. Yeah, yeah. Like huge. we got a big spike in yeah. sales because you guys brought up our product. And we're like, <laughs> what? Can we work with you? And then that's how it all, yeah, yeah. it all worked out. But yeah, I think the message for health, you know, fitness and health minded individuals, because um, quality of life is important. Alcohol can definitely play a role in improving. Can also definitely take away from the quality of your life. But responsibly- you know, you connect with people. It's a good time. Loosens you up. Um, it can help, you know, lower inhibitions in terms of conversation. I, you know, it can lead to just a, you know, just a good time if it's done responsibly and occasionally. So if you're, you're health minded, you, you can definitely hack yeah. how are you going to do this thing? So you minimize, you know, the negative. It's so funny going through all this, like before, you know, knowing there's products like that out there before knowing really what was happening uh, in terms of like why my hangovers were so bad certain times. Like I would, I would try and trace it back and then I would mix a different type of alcohol. I was like, maybe it's just rum, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to go whiskey now and I'm just going to do vodka. And so I would stick with like certain ones. I didn't get like as bad of a, a hangover with. And usually it was all like dehydration was a big factor yep. to that. And then two, just like, like you said, drinking later at night because alcohol itself is just, one of the worst substances to get a good night's sleep. After. I can't. Yeah. I can't. I end up it just sweating. doesn't work. I sweat all night yep. and I, I have nightmares and wake up nightmares and wake up. It's like the same damn story. 
Uh, Every single time. Z-Biotics has been life-changing for me. Yeah. I've, I've never been... Uh, you a, always had a bad reaction. Always had yeah, me too. a really, really bad reaction with alcohol. Even like just one or two <laughs> drinks. Like I couldn't... It just one or two drinks would cause headaches or poor sleep or... And so I just never, which is partly why I gravitated to cannabis as like my way of like a partying or relaxing or socializing would be, that would be my choice because alcohol just never made me feel good. And then I have a wife who is the opposite, who like, that's her thing is like they, she would much rather. Some people have, break down alcohol so well. Oh, her, her whole family is that way. You, mm -hmm. see, you can say there's a genetic thing. You can see it. You yeah. can see it in the whole, the whole family has this ability to be able to drink like that. And no one's ever hung over like blows my mind but so weird. since zbiotic i've been able to to do that and it's you know i don't i still don't drink a lot but i've been able to have things like the like in the past i'd go to a christmas party like that and i would not partake in any drinks at all and that was half the fun i mean they had custom drinks that they made just for our christmas party yeah. and they were was a fabulous Pantini, i think was one yeah they were fabulous yeah. it was a, it was a really a, a really good time and, and enjoy it but it's uh something that i i couldn't do in the past you know so. some people have uh, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's an allergic reaction. I'm not quite sure, but um, they have a reaction to it where it flushes yeah. their skin. Yeah, Courtney has that bit in her cheeks. Does she? Yeah. So I think it's more common in Asian populations. Uh -huh. Is that true, Doug? Yeah, very, very common. Is there? A, do you know what it's called? I don't know. I could uh, look it up here. So my, or something? my sister's partner, Mike, great guy, love him, police officer, San Jose, shout out. Um, he's like, he can't touch alcohol. Like he has one drink and he gets this really negative um effect from it so yeah it's interesting the worst hangover hangover i ever had in my entire life ever without actually getting sick because of course if you drink and get sick that's not great but i'll never forget this my cousin myself and then my buddy don who you guys know he now is one of the vps for ufc gyms yeah, yeah. we were down in palm uh, <clears throat> palm springs this is back when we invested in that gym down there and, you know, my cousin was going through some rough times and we're all just kind of hanging out. And I was probably 22, <clears throat> 21, 22. And we bought, do you guys know, have you guys ever seen the, those jugs of red wine? It was like a little handle. Oh like my this. God. Yeah, yeah. And it's a big jug. Yeah, yeah, and dude. at the bottom, it looks like a wicker kind of That like would basket. destroy me. I already know. Yeah. Okay. Just wine in general, but like cheap wine and drinking that. Oh my God. I would have the worst hangover. It's four gallons. Ugh. It's four gallons of cheap red wine. <laughs> and the three of us had crushed it. Ugh. And I remember the next day working That's and I'm, painful. you know, I'm like 21 or 22. Headache. Oh, not only that, but I, I smelled like it. <laughs> you ever do that? Yeah, the next day, your pores. Senior pores. Oh yeah. God, it was terrible. No. I had never felt anything like I that. I can't before. Tell you can remember your like worst hangover. That's how bad it was. <laughs> yeah. It's, That's, yeah, that's gotta be pretty bad. I was gonna, uh, to answer the flushing question about Asian populations, they tend to have a deficiency in an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, <gasps> which breaks down acetaldehyde. Probably look that up, Doug. Probably. Type in that enzyme function. <laughs> that's interesting. So I wonder if Zbiotics would help. That. I have never yeah. had Mike try that. Yeah, that'd before. be cool. I wonder if that would be a good thing. You said he's a San Jose PD? San Jose PD. Did you know if he knew my buddy, Justin, who just passed? Did you, I didn't did ask you? him. Oh, yeah, they no, had I to. I haven't asked him. Yeah, he's just yeah. was a, a sergeant there. Oh, he's got to know him. Yeah, I didn't even know that. I would, how did you, I would have had, they probably knew each other for sure. Yeah, Mike's a great guy. He served in, uh, he served in the Middle East, in the military, <clears throat> super respectful, very nice guy. You know, my, my has he been a cop him. for a while too? He he has. I remember when he went through the whole process. They've got to know each other. Yeah, so when he went through the whole process, I remember how tough it was because I guess when they first start you out, you get like the the worst shifts, you know what I mean? So like, okay, here you go. You're just getting started. Your shift is one a.m. to four a.m. or oh, whatever, man. you know. Yeah. And he would get home graveyards. Be, yeah. Oh, he'd be so burnt out. What does it say there, Doug? Yeah, it's a lot of mumbo jumbo to me. But uh, the main pathway of ethanol metabolism involves its conversion to acetaldehyde, a reaction which is mediated by an enzyme oh. known as alcohol dehydrogenase. Androgenesis. Now, Doug, when you go back, look up the symptoms because this is going to help highlight the symptoms of having too much acetaldehyde in the blood. What are the symptoms of having <clears throat> this situation? What are they? So I don't know what it was called, but what is it? What happens to the to them? Nausea. What do they feel headaches, sure. as a result of drinking alcohol? Because because <clears throat> since they don't have this enzyme that mediates acetaldehyde, it'll give us probably a good idea of what for the average person would feel like if they just had too much. I mean, yeah, as I say, guess probably all a bunch all of hangover the same, yeah. Uh, yeah, so facial flush, flush, elevated heart rate, headache, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, hyperventilation, low blood pressure, 
vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. Yeah. Yep. There yep. you go. The <laughs> covers, wow. covers the bases there. <laughs> That's a checklist, isn't it? I wonder if there's anybody who's like that listening before. that actually has that, I guess, that issue and then has, has not even tried drinking because of that. I, we can't, okay, I don't want to advocate for Z-Biotics specifically for this because I don't know if it would do that, but it, on your own, you could try sure it. Sure sounds like it. On your own, you could try it and, and let us know because uh, I don't know any, there's nothing else out there because it's a patented product, right? So yeah. other companies, will what they'll typically do is support the liver. So if you find something for alcohol, a supplement, it's always like supports the liver and detox, supports the liver. But this is about that to breaking me, down. That, that's like the the old hack that you used to do before we have heads ago. We used to have us take two charcoal and a Tylenol. Yeah, and oh, charcoal. Charcoal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ty- yeah. yeah. That's kind of like the, that, that move. I feel like that's how most, most of the mostly over the counter stuff is pretty basic. What they what they do. Yeah, As, uh, uh, activated charcoal is just a great general something's up with my gut. Yeah. Type of thing, literally cheap. By the way, a lot of people don't know you buy activated charcoal. It comes charcoal. in handy for sure. Super cheap. You have any gut? It's like an immediate relief for bloating or sourness. And or what, it's weird. because the charcoal sucks everything up, yeah. right? It sucks it up, and then it makes it so that your body can't absorb it, and then you literally just poop it out. I remember tripping out on that as a kid. I told you my story of when my brother and his friend like fed me a bunch of cough syrup. I literally drank like two bottles of cough syrup. Wait, why did they do that? Because they're playing doctor and they're, I was the patient and they're like <laughs> feeding me cough syrup. How old were you? Dude, I was like, I don't know, six or something, oh five or six. God, so you got totally ripped. Just, just, just shredded. Maybe that's the no, not source, like that. <laughs> source of all my gut problems. I'm, I'm not talking about being shredded like with abs or anything. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, so what they do, they take the hospital and just give you yeah. a ton of and it, The irony of it was, so my brother's friend, his mom was a nurse in the ER, and she was there when they brought me in. She was so mad, dude. Oh, I oh, bet. She was going to struggle. Oh, I, I bet. Yeah. That's, older brothers are just. I, dude, you know, yeah. I went, I was. Through the ringer. That was the eighties, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you used to let, let your kids, your 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 older, the, yeah, oh. <laughs> your your ten year old watch your six year old. <laughs> I've done, I, oh, my, yeah, poor, my younger brother, dude. Poor. I, I did. You throw me to the wolves all the time, man. I, I remember my younger brother. One. I don't know how I talked him into this. We watched Home Alone. No, I don't think it was Home Alone. It was way before that. Anyway, uh, we, 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 I I convinced him to let me. What's the? Is it is it duct tape? The gray tape, the one that's yeah. sticky. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. I convinced him duck to it. let me duct tape. His hands to his head like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we yeah. thought it would be funny. Like, okay, hey, this is a good idea. And then, yeah, and he's chasing me around. Uh, but then when you go to take it off, yeah. we couldn't take it off. And he was <laughs> crying, and my mom was about Dude. to come home, and I had to cut his hair with scissors. Uh, was- that reminds me of, I just saw some, like, I don't know how popular this is or not, but uh, it was really funny, this this lady, like they, they call it some challenge where it's like the foot face challenge or something. And this lady like sticks her face and her friends will sit on the couch, her foot like on her face. And then her friend behind her, like taped the foot to her face. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and the lady's like, ah, ah, ah. I was like, that's so oh, she's sleeping or something. Yeah. Foot right on her face. That's messed up, dude. Could you imagine two of them trying to get her? Yeah. Like, ah, ah, ah. And I want to do that. Foot. Oh, that's like my worst. Worst nightmare, dude. I told you guys my, my thing with feet. Dude. Oh, God, on your yeah. face. Oh, yeah. You ever yeah. seen the one where when people are sitting in like a, those plastic chairs, you know, with the ar- like it's got the arms, but there's like a gap. They'll take a broomstick and put it through the arms over the person. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they'll smack them and run. And if you try and get up, you're stuck yeah, in the chair. Just, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you I see that one? That. That's a good I one, too. That. Today's YouTube giveaway is Map Strong. Here's how you can win it. Leave us a comment after... 24 or within 24 hours of us dropping this, right? So leave a comment below this video and also subscribe to this channel and also turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section that you won strong. Also, we got a sale going on. Maps old time strength is half off and so is Maps OCR, both 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Good times. <laughs> uh, so did I, so I saw something interesting on um pasta and a theory as to why pasta people will say this often that they'll eat pasta in Italy and it won't affect them like it does over here. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't and your yeah. theory just the, uh, the uh, desiccation uh, process, yeah. right? No, the pesticide. Yeah. Like that. The, the herbicides, herbicides. That herbicides. That was a theory, yeah. right? You know what this guy says? And it's actually kind of makes sense. Pasta here is dried at a very hot temperature. And by the way, you could see it. So this guy pulls out pasta from Italy, pasta from here. 
the pasta from here is much more yellow than the one from Italy. So they dry it at such a high temperature that it makes the gluten in Seeps the pasta in, more uh, damaging to the body or harder to digest. Sorry. Oh, okay. Harder to digest in the body. Interesting. Huh. That seems plausible because it's the most obvious. You know? So why why do we cook it at such higher temperatures? Faster production. Really? Yeah. It's and you know, pump out more. Yeah. And you know, Italy's- um, So funny. They have such a, they have a very interesting food culture there where they take a lot of pride in doing things a particular way that even if it's slower, even if it costs more, it's like, well, it stands on its own. I mean, if you ask anybody like where they're going to go in Europe for like the, where they're known for food, it's, it's Italy. Yeah. You know, it's just like one of those staples. I, I, it's cool to see them too put a stop to the uh, fake meat. The bandit coming in. You can't too. come in. You can't make yeah. fake meat over. Did, 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 uh, have you guys ever seen or tried who's been to Italy? You have. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Neither one of you? Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. No, I've always wanted to go. I had a buddy who went to Italy, asked for um, a cafe latte uh, with uh, soy milk or almond milk. I don't remember which and one. They laughed at him, probably. No, they don't laugh. They, just, they don't have. No, no. He said, Can I have a, a, um, a, a cappuccino? Sorry. Can I have a cappuccino with almond milk? This is the response. The guy looked at him, No. <laughs> and he goes, well, Excuse me. And then he turned around. You don't and have it. And yeah. he, turned, he goes, that is not a cappuccino. And he turns back around. He's like, like he offended him. Yeah, yeah. How dare you ask me to make something like that? <laughs> Get out of here. That's like, in like New York, it's like that in some places too. If you try to change things up, uh, oh, uh, in certain like, uh, yeah, like sandwich places, I love coffee that. places. I know. I respect it, man. So it's like, I. you know, this is what I'm offering. You know, take it or leave it. I like the, uh, hey, it's not for everybody. I didn't make it for everybody. I made it for specific people yeah. that like this type of thing because I like that sort of thing. Have I'm you guys not, been in New York City? To New York, never, no, no I, yeah. So I, Chicago's. So I've never been there, but the, or they, the, I guess people say that people are rude there, right? Or like really short and yeah. Well, it's like, it's like a pride. I trained a lot of clients their... that were from New York, and I love them. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 super direct, and that can come off as rude or you know in your face, yeah. unfiltered. Or, yeah, but I love. I can. Yeah. I could totally appreciate that. That humor and that candor too. I. Li I'd rather have somebody who's like that, and so you get that. From yeah, a lot all of East them Coast like that. People Every like client that. I had that was like from New York, born yeah. and raised New York, and they were now over here in Cali. With her, like I had some that were like traveling or consultants, and they were only in California for a certain period of time. And uh, yeah, they definitely had this like directness. Yeah, because people unique. are people are rude in California too, but it's probably I think it's a different kind of rude. It's a di it's, like it's like passive like aggressive rude. rude. Yeah. yeah, it's like yeah, it's I'm like gonna fake. do this to you. Yeah, like <laughs> okay, you know, <laughs> oh, like whatever. That's why everybody you know. hates the California people everywhere else in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, dude. Uh -huh. Don't you, you ever notice that? That's why I, I remember when I was a kid when I I remember to Colorado. I remember like telling people I was from California. Like instantly, everybody hates you. Yeah. Nobody, you know why? Because everybody that leaves leaves there comes and migrates to these other states that are kind of a slower pace. And, they try to make it in California. Yeah, yeah. And that, I think that's, that way you left California. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's the idea, right? Yeah, but I think I think it's a different kind. I know when I was in Tennessee, um, the southern hospitality, you know, what they'll, what they'll say. I mean, it was real, man. People were really, really friendly. Yeah, and yeah. just kind of a nice, you know. I liked it. I yeah. prefer that. I don't know uh, if I'd like the New York. I do too. But anyway, we'll see. I brought up the other day the uh, you guys. I told you guys that Mark Cuban. I thought maybe I was speculating about um, running for president. Yeah, running for president. Now I see some rumor of him trying to do like some mega casino or something over in in Dallas. Did you see this, Andrew? Have you heard anything about this? Uh -huh. Yeah, was that right after I had said that to you guys? And uh, wait, uh, you can have a is casino. It I don't. He's trying to. He's trying. Is to it make, legal or is it like? I think a that's what he's trying to. I think he's okay. trying to make it legal. I think he's trying to build like a look up for me so I can get my facts straight. But originally, I thought that that was the speculation was uh, he's selling a big portion off. You know, they're getting his three billion or whatever it was from the the Mavs that was going to help him run for president. Now I'm seeing stuff pop up that. He's potentially trying to build like a little mini. Now he'd rather house. be Biff from uh, Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. Yeah, uh, All right. It? Good what, on you, Mark. Biggest yeah. money makers in casinos are the slot machines, right? Just the, aren't those the biggest I ones? mean, everything is. That's the best odds for the casino. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I don't know. That's a good question like because- the biggest money Because there's things that are way higher. Dollar, like craps, you're playing with way more money at the table. So I, I don't know if, if slots are technically- the best i mean they're like the the best odds for them like as far and like losing for people so in that that aspect but then you're not you're not talking about huge 
high hands like you are in in a poker or or a craps game. Well, you're the you're mm. the of, of all of us. You're the you're the most uh, versed or well versed, I guess, in, in gambling. You've, you've done it the most or whatever. What's the biggest payday you've come back with? Like, what's the most the biggest wins in one trip? Twelve, fourteen thousand. Wow. Around. Yeah. Wow. That's around. great. Mm -hmm. All right. What's the biggest loss? Ten. Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I lost that in like, I remember, I'll never forget that. I've, I've told you guys this, this story before. <clears throat> that was my first introduction to um, you're nobody special in Vegas. Oh, because you lost 10. You thought they Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, so, so I used to gamble a lot in Reno. And in Reno, if you gamble three or five grand, you're, you know, kind of a baller. Yeah, baller. <laughs> yeah kind of a baller. I mean, I've, but I could be gambling five grand and, you know, they'll take care of my rooms. They'll take care of my food. They'll even send a limo for me to go, go places and stuff like that. So they'll, they'll, they'll really want and dine you for that kind of money being gambled consistently. Right. Uh, and then Vegas, it was like, I had just came off of like a, a trip from Reno like that. And then I was at the, um, I think it was at the Palms and I, I just got to the crowd and I was betting aggressive and like, it was within an hour. I think I lost $10,000. <sighs> And I was like super, I was, in, I was in a bad mood and like in my head, like, of course, trying to reframe it. Well, I'll just go get myself like one of the luxury suites and chill, maybe watch some basketball or something. It was around that time of the season. And uh, I'm going to go see my host and go, uh, go tell them what I lost and have them upgrade my room. You know, <laughs> I walk in there and say, Hey, you know, I just, uh, you know, I just lost. I said, I'm going to go up to my room, but I was wondering could you uh, could you look at my comps and you know uh, set, set me up with a, a better room than what I'm in? Put me in a suite or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir, Mr. Schaefer. And they're like pulling it up and they're like, oh yeah, sorry, you don't you don't qualify for any comps. I said, what? I just <laughs> lost ten thousand dollars. I was like, this is qualifying me for anything? Oh no, it doesn't doesn't. I'm sorry, sorry about that. And I'm like, fuck, that hurt. Here's dude. a free bottle of water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't gambled He's like that in a, in a long time. I told you that's another thing too, man. I realized like, um, it, it, I'm, I was easily influenced with my friends that are into that. Like that could pull me into that direction of right. gambling like that. Like I don't, I'm not hanging out with any of that crew anymore. And so I still sports bet, um, but only on games I'm watching only on my, on my team. Like, and, and there it's very minimal amount. Are you, by the way, are you positive this season? Cause I know you guys are doing fantasy football and you're, you're like, I know you and you and and Andrew are like fighting for second because I think Kyle's, <laughs> yeah, so we had Kyle's keep, roasting you guys, right? Yeah, yeah, Kyle is the yeah Kyle was the 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 definitely the undercover yeah. the quiet of course the quiet kid who the quiet killer. You know I should have known, but <clears throat> you know I should have known the way he approaches everything. being a trainer, everything. He puts his head down. That and the, and yes, he's great. so he was so quiet and undercover about it. Like Andrew's talking shit like me. We're going back and forth, you know, with all these kids and quiet and quiet Kyle over there. You know what I'm saying? Studying, <laughs> studying, <laughs> studying, <laughs> studying, and on the waiver yes. wire. Assassin. And yeah. yeah, and he's yeah. just thumping everybody. And so uh, Andrew and I are tied yeah. and we had a game last night. I gave and up it was a, a pretty game. epic comeback, comeback win for uh for me. He had me he was up by like fifty something points going into which is a lot in fantasy football and uh going into Monday night and, and I came back and won I won by like what point seven? He's not even going to answer on this uh, podcast. <laughs> he's, he's sour. He's bro. so salty <laughs> about it. Like, he was. You know why? Because I came in on Andrew's on, competitive. So on Monday it. morning, yeah. so Monday night football is the game, right? So Monday morning, I come in. He's up fifty some points, and I, and I told him, I said, "Oh man, I almost had you." And it was good. He's like, "No, nah, I wasn't even worried, dude." It wasn't even <laughs> close. I'm like, "Hey, well, careful! I still got two more guys. You never know." You're like, "Yeah, I'm not worried." That's so it was his attitude. <laughs> <laughs> <I ain't talking laughs> shit, <laughs> and it did. So he literally, so the game came down to overtime last night i'm down 50 something points it's the end of the game like minute a minute left so what are the odds i'm still gonna lose by like five points and then a, a, I, my players get a couple big catches to make me within one point wow. and then the game like a crazy way it unfolds ends up going to overtime mm -hmm. so it extends the game <laughs> and they go into overtime and then i get a, i get yeah. another catch and i literally win by like not even a full point i think wow. i won by 0.7 yeah so yeah, Andrew is Andrew's trying to call in sick to work things. today. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'm not going to make it in today. It's, it's, get your ass in here. His review comes up. Uh, Sunglasses. Yeah. Now I, you guys, you guys. So uh, you never 
got into gambling yourself or did you ever have any close friends that were really into I it? gambled with supplements. That's about as far as I got. Like, <laughs> Your life. Like, can I take like, this thing? I gamble with my life. Yeah, you know, let's see what this together. does. <laughs> let's see what happens. Jackpot. Let me tell you, a couple of times I lost, yeah. <laughs> but I always came out on top. Yeah, I, play, I played a little bit. I mean, we would go, we were just so broke, dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun, dude. Like you get really mad, you know, and you lose. Mm. It's, when you have no money. Yeah. Like, you know, they I, say I, that's the I part. never, you, I mean, here's the thing. Okay. So you were in that industry, right? Where you had like this expendable cash that yeah. you're like, yay. Yeah. Like we, we never had the expendable cash experience. Yeah, it was yeah. like very like tight. So, but I was like very much on a uh, blackjack kick for a long time. And I was like, I can, you know, I can figure this one out. Like yeah. I can do you know, single deck and then yeah. like multiple deck. And I'm, I think I have this figured out. My grandma could literally count cards. Oh, wow. And like, wow. I always wanted it. And she was like, so like Puritan, like it was against like gambling or dancing or anything, you know, dancing. Well, yeah, dude, you know, like back in the day, like th that was a thing, like in these like Puritan kind of it's church. Like, it's like, like remember, uh, Footloose. Yeah, Footloose. It's like Footloose. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah. It's like, like literally like that. Like she, although she broke that rule, like with my grandpa, they would every, every now and then they do like these swing dance and stuff yeah. to like the old timey Doug music. It was great. Basically anything that could potentially make kids horny was against the rules. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Like, basically. Anything at all. Yeah. That could potentially make you. Oh, wow. He is. Is that what I'm reading? Am I reading that correctly? Yeah. So to. Take it away from fantasy. Oh, you are here. Going okay. back to the Mark Cuban <laughs> sale. <laughs> um, Mark Cuban had sold the company to a woman named Miriam Adelson. And her and her family, they own a company called the Las, Las Vegas Sands Corporation, which is basically like this luxury resort company uh, of casinos in Vegas. And their goal is to basically, right here what it says... Uh, it's a far-reaching ratification beyond ba basketball considerations. Their goal basically is to led to influence legislators in Texas to allow casino gambling. Oh, all right. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Good or bad thing? What do you guys think? Casino. Uh, I'm not against it. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess. It, in, or how can I be? In districts where they're <laughs> like, they want it. I'm yeah. Super anti it. I yeah. Think, I think. <laughs> Freaks nothing but crime and prostitution. Well, I mean, listen, it's that uh, would be like it's, somebody's it's, response. Uh, like anything else, it could be a very unhealthy addiction. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm, from a, um, uh, I I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm like, this is where I am, <laughs> like you in the the libertarian sense. Like, even though I, I wouldn't call myself a libertarian, I think there are certain things that I'm just like, you know, it should be up to us to yeah. discipline ourselves to 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 not to or to do that stuff, like. It's the other, I think it's the other, you, I mean, you just said it, I think it's the other behaviors that it, it tends to bring Promote. along with it mm -hmm. that people are, are against. They like, get nervous about it. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like the alcohol well, consumption, the partying, uh oh, now we got, you know, prostitution and other drugs. Yeah. I mean, that. I'm sure they'll get a little bit of that response, especially it just depends where he's going to put it. Right. I would imagine, you know, it, it, whether it's close to a bunch of schools or, you know, oh, those right. kind of considerations. Yeah. I'm sure they would like. Yeah, you can't even go way, that. way Next far. Next to a school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just not good for the, the kids, you guys. No it's not good for the kids. <laughs> There's a teacher. Think yeah. about it. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's funny. I've, um, I think I heard one time that the, the, the addictive part of it is actually the losing part, not the winning part. Have you ever heard that before? Is it the trying to get it back? No, it's just what happens chemically in your body from a loss is what triggers the the, the, re, the impulsive behavior. Yes, it's not that the win. Sense. It's that not sense. the win. It has something to do with the, lo that the makes loss. Sense. Maybe Doug can find find that or Andrew hmm. find that. But I remember reading that one time. Being What's like, addictive? Uh, uh, what? Why is gambling addictive? Or what yeah, are the addictive? Yeah, is it the, it's the it has something to do with the loss, not the win. Which I, you find I find that really interesting. Which also. He explains why some people can like when they lose they they go yeah. they go crazy like they the self sabotage going, people. Yeah. What would you be? Mo what's the one thing that you are most likely, if you were to have an addict an addiction that's like that's you know damaging to your life? What would be the one thing that would be? Do we have to reveal this? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I would I would say I would say uh, I mean 
you guys know me really well, so I'm pretty good about all all these things. Obviously, that, none of us but, here have that issue. I'm right, just right. saying, if you were to pick one thing, I mean, I think I think that could be one of the, being a father and a family and, and like your. I mean, imagine I know people that like they can they've like leveraged their house and like I crazy. know someone that had mm-hmm. yeah yeah. So I mean, I think that could be like, and it's not you can't visually see it. Like if someone becomes a heroin addict or a coke mm-hmm. addict or whatever like that, like you could tell. Yeah, your wife is probably going to be up and up on what's going yeah. on. I mean, I guess you could probably hide that, but it's less likely to hide yeah but my, i mean man remember when we met um um brett and his wife came mm-hmm. over and and she said that he was hiding it from her yeah he was while. he was a half a million dollars Ooh. he had lost wow imagine losing five hundred thousand dollars and your partner not having any idea and then imagine that was your entire state your in- retirement and savings and you were leveraging the house i mean god that would be just that could be really because yeah. now you're not just destroying you're your life you're destroying your your yeah. families and others. Not to say that alcohol and be, drugs couldn't do that too. There's, there's right. be almost no chance for me to have a, an issue with gambling. I just don't like it. But mm-hmm. I could see just just substances. Uh, yeah. And I do this with supplements already. I could see like I like you know feeling you know whatever good or whatever. Yeah, that's why I haven't tried. Yeah, it's like any of those like that are like geared towards uh stimulations and yeah. like you know like the real yeah i was like i gotta steer clear of those because me and caffeine already is oh, yeah, problematic so true. i'm like i'm like i gotta make sure i i you know put a good stop to this yeah, so, okay. so the urge to get it back is what is gets stronger and stronger as the loss so the, is that so yeah it, my, it probably causes an internal panic yeah. Right. And that's except what happens in, in is the, that what it feels like to you? Yeah, you know, I've definitely and this is why I have like rules, right? To like how I do it. So like it, it and what I'll never allow myself to do, I should not not say never because this is when I know I'm like, okay, I have to pull away, is if I catch myself doing that where it's like, oh, you I lost five, I lost yeah, I break the rule. I, I lost five hundred bucks. So all of a sudden I want to bet another uh, another game and now I want to bet a thousand or two thousand bucks. Yeah. Where it's like, no, my rule is that when you, I lose, I start back at the bottom at 250 again and work my work my way up on the winning. And I, if I lose, mm-hmm. I got to reset and start over again. Not the opposite, which is you have the impulse to want to go, well, I'll make that back and win some because I'll double up. Right. You know going. what's interesting about all this is that uh, betting – with the stock market is is totally fine. Like n- not investing in companies, but you can actually bet on a company failing. You can actually do that. If people don't know this about you investing. It. You can go in and buy uh, you shorts. Know, yeah, you yeah, can you short. short so, and that's, that's what you're literally doing. I, I bet this one's going to go bad. Oh, I, I would bet. make the case, Sal, that mo- like uh, this would be an interesting stat to see too, that most people that buy stocks are gambling too. Very few people are 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 doing a, like a a fund where they are actually just putting it away yeah. methodically. Yeah, they're probably not methodical. I mean, it. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of buying stock the same way. I like this company. Oh, there, I heard this. I'm going to yeah. do that. Mm-hmm. Like that's gambling. I mean, that's the, yeah. when you gamble on sports. It's the same thing. It's like, oh, I got an inside track. Draymond Green's going to be sick tonight, tomorrow night. Like, and they had the betting line doesn't know yet, so I'm betting against this. Like. That's what that that's what that is. The people are doing the same thing with companies. They're like, oh, I hear they're coming out with this new software. So I'm gonna bet on that yeah. stock. Like it's very speaking similar. of companies that bet. So this I don't know if this is a, a I guess it's a compliment, but more and more people, more and more companies, people send these to me, by the way. So if you're a company <laughs> and you're gonna do this, I mean, I'm gonna see it. And it, I don't I guess I guess you can. I don't know if I mean I, I don't think it's like illegal, so long as you don't misrepresent or whatever. But people are taking clips of our show. When we talk about something and using it to sell the product. Oh, I saw the bands one the other day. Yeah. So it's like me talking about the value of like resistance bands. And it's literally me talking on our podcast. And I'm not affiliated with this company. I'm not <laughs> selling their bands. I didn't yeah. ever even tried it. But they're using what I said on the yeah. show about bands as like, authority. To I, this, I, this guy's a sales genius. Yeah, yeah. Let's put some bands behind him. Yeah. Uh, people send it to us like, uh, like to shut it down or stuff. I, I like it. It's a positive thing. Yeah. So long I mean, as they don't misrepresent. Well, yeah, that's the, the one where they changed your voice is another. Situation. That was weird. Like that's that, different. Like that's AI. that's literally yeah. They're using AI to manipulate what you said. That's misrepresenting. But if they clip out something that we say yeah. and they happen to sell a, a product or a thing that represents what like if we, I bring up a study about something. Yeah, use that clip yeah. Or? I mean, I think that. I mean, and what I like about it, aside from it's just it's just free exposure for us and in, in advertising. It would the, the goal was always to to reach this like uh, authority type of position in the fitness space, right? That was the point of using the podcast to 
to be able to do that. And to me, that is, it's being he, recognized as that. Now, here's the Otherwise, why else would you do that? He, he, here's the bad move. I'll tell, I'll say this. First off, you know, you got to make it clear that I'm not working with that company because I don't want people, we place a lot of yeah. value and time and energy into vetting the people that we promote. So I don't want people yeah. to get the wrong idea. That's the only see, real detriment. Yeah. Like I don't want someone buying a product because they saw me yeah. say something about uh, you know, a study or something. Uh, we haven't thinking, vetted it or anything. Right. And they think, oh, Mind Pump is totally vouching for this company. And then it's a ship product hurts someone or something like that. So that you got to make that clear. But, but for like the if you're going to do it and you make it clear and all that stuff, fine. Send us the, the product. At least do something to let us know. <laughs> like, don't just do it all weird. I mean, like I, that. Would, I would just do I mean, it because that's why. If I give you guys free shit, I'm just going to use it. It's shifty, authority. dude. You know, yeah. yeah it's, talk shit about it's, I mean, so for the audience, so like, grift in that this. are, that, want to know or maybe it bothers them because of the, for the reasons you're saying is you can go to mindpumppartners.com that is like we created I've those created are the, only partners yeah you create that url for that exact reason because we always get people that are like where is this code or do you guys is this a company you guys mindpumppartners.com and you can literally see everybody that we work with or represent and if they're not on that list and they're using sal saying something then yeah they're probably yeah. ripping the content uh, i gotta sure. talk to you guys about a new show i found well this is all in the vein of like some of the ghosts and the spirits and all oh, that cool. kind of stuff I get into. Uh, but it's called the dead files. And so the premise is basically like you have like a detective guy, ex de detective, and then you have like a medium lady. And so simultaneously in the beginning, like the detective guy kind of does all the historical references and he interviews like everybody involved in their uh, exact stories and everything. And he kind of like writes it all out and everything. And then, she does this kind of walk through later on and like, you know, sort of feels the house and in the spirits and whatnot and like kind of the visions that she gets and all that. And it's really interesting to see how they like completely like merge at the end and how accurate she is with a lot of these kinds of things and all that. It's totally uh, real, right? It's totally real. And it's, it's hundred <laughs> percent believable. There's no, there's, no there's no like, yeah, there's no like <laughs> putting props in place ahead of time or any of that kind of shenanigans, you guys. It's like TV. So it's honest. <laughs> and um so, so but it's entertaining it's really entertaining yeah. but so as entertaining as this is uh there was like a specific episode i have to bring this up because it's hilarious uh like because there'll be like spiritual describe and you know they'll have like different uh characteristics and whatnot and like some of them are like like this is like like a bone collector one or like, this is like a, Oh, uh, like they have their own. They, yeah. Their own like, like brands attributes. Of these people. Like this one is the, the one that like chokes you out. Like, you know, you feel like paralyzed sometimes like, when oh. you're, when you're, like in this state of like half asleep and half awake. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, so like the, the, these people's house, uh, like they're being tormented by these spirits or whatever. And, uh, like basically it's the worst, <laughs> the worst one I've ever heard her kind of describe. She's like, basically this, cause some of them used to be like real people that like they murdered people in there. And so it's like the remnants of their energy or whatever. And so it was this, uh, she's like, some, do you feel like you're being watched? And you're like, this is like, this one's a bit of a stalker. And they're like, Oh no, that's not good. Whatever. And it gets like worse. So they had like, uh, her connect with this, this, um, artist who draws like what, she sees and then what the artist has like some kind of like ability as well to like <laughs> see the, <laughs> you watch, see this like right so she's drawing it's it's fucking entertaining you guys and so she's drawing like what this spirit looks like in like the room and everything and then they put it in a folder and this is like a reveal and they do this like multiple times on the like, like different somebody? shows it's so, so, <laughs> so they have this envelope and they're like going to like uh, tell the, the, you know, these poor owners like, okay, so here's the spirit that, you know, we've like, I saw and that, you know, this artist sort of depicted for you and they like reveal it. And it's this spirit up in the corner and it's this fat guy who's like jacking off <laughs> <laughs> they drew that yes oh my god ah, i was fucking dying dude <laughs> we have a perverted spirit up there like getting off every time we're hanging out in the bedroom i'm like wow this show is nuts hey 
A, most realistic depiction of what would a ghost would probably do. <laughs> like, what if yeah. trying to kill Imagine people? that. Like, yeah. and I'm, <laughs> assuming the people that, I'm assuming the people I'm that come on this show right are like, they're they're bought in. So they like, they believe it when they yeah, see it. Yeah, they're like, oh, dude, oh, I, I knew know. it. I knew it. <laughs> hey, I low That's where that schmutz came from. You know? Oh, you know, uh, uh, ectoplasm. I, yeah, I, anyway. <laughs> I low key, at, when, when, I, when I watched Ghostbusters when I was a kid, I was a little older, but you know, you kind of come of an coming of age, so I'm like 12, 13 or whatever. Remember the scene where uh I don't remember what's his name? Venkman? Is it who which one was Dan Aykroyd? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Was he Peter Venkman? No, he wasn't Peter. That no, was uh, anyway uh, Bill Murray. Uh, uh he's where he gets like the, the Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd, yeah, where where the ghost has sex with him. Remember that scene? Uh -huh, it ends yeah. up so I'm like 13 year old kid and I saw that scene. I was like, What? You know he's on Joe Rogan and he still claimed like it's happened to him in real life. He's actually had a... He's had, like, a sexual encounter with a ghost. See, I thought, that's what I kind of, like, kind of thought I would, you know, kind of wanted that when I was like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, like this, bro. This might be cool. <laughs> you know, you're, you're a 13-year-old kid, you know what I mean? You're like... <laughs> did he really cool. claim that he did? Yes. Oh, that's... He's, a, he's, he's an odd bird. I mean, he has, like... Uh, uh, he, he's very much into the paranormal. Let's put it that way, wow. if you guys listen to him. Did you know... So, the one where uh, sleep paralysis... It, that's a common one where people feel like there's a, de a, a demonic entity sitting on them and mm -hmm. holding them down. And they're, they'll like kind of wake up and see this dark figure pressing on them. It's a very commonly reported um, thing among people who said they've seen a spirit. Really? Yeah. I uh -huh. can't think of anything more terrifying. You wake yeah. up and there's a dark figure just holding you. Down. I've never had the dark figure, but I've, you've had that before where you're kind of like, paralysis? I've yeah, where you kind of like, you can't tell if you're in or out, you know? It's when, panic inducing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the worst feeling ever. But it's always quick, though. It's like for a moment. For oh, a moment. I can be in it for a while, dude. Oh, really? I can be in it for a while to the point where I'm hoping someone wakes me up. Oh, you know wow. what's interesting? Yeah. I feel like I've had that when I got up and then I went back to sleep. So, like, yeah. like in the morning, especially when it's light out and I go back to sleep and then it. I've had that happen. I've to, had like the worst nightmares when I go back to sleep during the day. Like, oh yeah, if, I don't understand that. Or when you're like, sick, you ever sleep when you're sick? They're always nightmares. Yeah, Ugh, the worst. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, but the sleep paralysis thing, I know how to get out of it because it used to happen to me so much when I was a kid. And the key is you have to start moving somehow because once you start moving, your body wakes up enough. But because you're paralyzed, nothing moves. So I would focus on this, like my 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 toe or my pinky or my tongue or something small that I could kind of move a little bit to yeah. get me to wake up. And it would, yeah. it would always work. I know what you were thinking, Stop too, it. Doug. I know what you were thinking. <laughs> something really like, kiku, kiku, kiku. <laughs> Do a little, <laughs> little push-ups. Your, your friends are watching you sleep on the couch. What's going whoa, whoa, what's what's on? What's happening? Right? Sorry, guys. I had to get myself up, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. speaking of weird stuff, did we talk about the invisibility cloak that China created? No, we did not. Have I you seen saw, that? Okay, I saw I saw a, a thing on it where they turned it sideways and then it like disappeared. Yeah. What what is it? So was it real? Is that real? Yeah. It looks real. Yeah. Yeah. You literally hide behind it. And I don't know how it works. Did you read up on it or No, I think I'm gonna guess. So here we go. I right? know. I, 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 I could guess, but I was yeah. okay. I think it can has to pull do, it up so we can see it, Doug, because I did see like a I think it has the way the, the way it, it refracts light and bends light so that it re, so that it makes what's behind you appear to be in front of you. Yeah. I don't think it's cameras or anything like that. You don't think it's cameras that the you know, some kind of LED screen that they I mean, it's, it's how a do they fabric. how do they omit the person though and still show the background? I don't know. That's the part that's like tripping me out. Yeah, I, I don't. Did they talk about how it works? I hope not. That's yeah, weird. I want to see it because I thought. Okay, it is the one I saw right there. That's the one I saw right there, where he like basically he's like hanging it yeah. in front of his legs, and yeah. you can see his legs. Yeah, in the background. but then, then the, the craziest is when they used it out in nature, and then the, the guy like covers himself with it and literally disappears. And really? you're like, oh my god, god that's crazy. Could you? Could you? Like, if you're the first person amongst your friends, it's the Harry this, Potter cloak. If you're the first dude in your group of friends to get this, the pranks you could play with this oh, yeah. would be just... Look at that. Isn't that yeah. wild? So it still has like kind of a blue hue I there, mean, it's not but, like perfect. But out in, I think out in the sun, like it, it even like blends in even better. Yeah, or just in nature. You wouldn't be able to see that. From yeah, what's wild is that away. we can... How, do we, how can we see through his legs like that? That's, I right? think it has to do with the way that it refracts light. But then again, why is there no shadow... I don't. I don't get it. I don't know. Damn it! Did you? So you guys haven't got somebody? Because okay, I saw this too, but I just totally dismissed it. Oh, here. Like some, yeah, look at this. Yeah, so, this is him in nature. Watch this. It's a he fabric, just, bro. Look, it's all folded up. 
Yeah, it's not he, like a hard. He just throws it over he him. Just throws it over, and then Shut literally up, immediately look, blends in. Look, look at this. this. Shut. What? Up. what? What? Like, there's no way he could find him, look. dude. Hide and seek champion. <laughs> immediately. Both sides work. Did what? you see that? Yeah. It's two sided. That's what I don't understand. Like, uh, what fabric that is? Okay, so n no one's Crazy. seen like. Okay, we've all seen these like clips. No one's seen like an interview Nano or something technology about dude. it yet. What if it, it's fake? Did it? I don't know. It yeah. just it just dropped. Yeah. So it's Chinese students. Look at that. It, it could very well just yeah, be it's December 9th. like this, a deep fake. Oh, this bro. is twenty twenty two. Yep. Uh, well, it went under the radar, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> all the rest of the shit. I didn't see that on. coming. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just saw a stat that said that, um, speaking of Chinese students, that the number one thing that Chinese kids want to be when they grow up is an astronaut. Hmm. The number one thing that American kids want to be YouTuber. when they grow up is a YouTuber. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it was just guess. Wow. Yeah. Team America. Yeah. We're yeah. fucking up, everybody. Yeah, we're going to. We need more we're astronauts. We're going to YouTube it. Not more <sighs> of that stuff. Anyway. All right. I want to ask you guys a quick question because uh, I see this often in our our Q and A's on Instagram and we never answer it because, well, I know why we don't answer it is because what, what may be the best thing for us isn't what's going to be the best thing for someone else, but it gets asked so often that I, I want to bring it up. And that is what is each of your favorite maps program? And don't make it the obvious one because we all know, like I, you know, maps anabolic. I you know, it was the first one I created that you like perform, but what are your, what is your favorite maps program? that you've used that's not one of the, I guess, the core ones. Do you guys have one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Old Time Strength. Brad, that one's become your favorite. It has, yeah. yeah. And it's and it's mainly just because it's um, stuff I used to play around with and mess around with just on my own, yeah. like, and try to get better at. And then having it deliberately programmed definitely made a difference in terms of the strength of that. But I always felt like those lifts, I wish I incorporated them more because they translate so well to everything else. I they just do. don't, I don't like put emphasis on them otherwise. Yeah. They do. It's so, it's so hard for me not, it, and if I were not to choose um, aesthetic, aesthetic yeah. it would probably be symmetry. Um, oh, yeah. I would have guessed that for you. Yes. Yeah, I definitely would have guessed that for you. Yeah. I, I mean, an aesthetic I know is the, the one you don't want me to choose, but it's just so hard not to, because it has nothing to do with that. It was the one that I, I like, whatever that was uh, related to my competing or that I, I, I influenced or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that. Most of my training career, uh, I felt like a, a big bulk of my clients were aesthetically driven or wanted to, to sculpt their body. They wanted more yeah. of a butt or they wanted to build their arms. They wanted a more developed chest. And and I identify with that. I'm, there, even to this day when I'm training, there's body parts. When I look at my physique, I'm like, oh, I should put a little more energy in this direction. I should put, So I'm always kind of doing that. And so I love that. I love that we wrote a program that allows you to – pick a muscle group or two and go, okay, Modify I'm going to, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try and sculpt my physique. And I think it's such an amazing thing that we can do that. So that it's hard to not say that is, is my favorite. Cause it is my favorite, but then symmetry. Uh, I mean, that one is, I'm really proud of that. And the, the, that's something that I, I would go to and default to if I'm not doing something like aesthetic, mm -hmm. because you, I mean, we talked, we've, I remember for so many years, we were talking about the benefits of unilateral training, yet we hadn't programmed mm -hmm. like a true unilateral uh, program. Um, and with the fact that we incorporated isometrics inside there, which uh, we'd never, I had never actually truly programmed isometric, like a, an actual phase of it. Like we did, I always integrated it into my training, but never actually programmed it out. Like we did in that. And then I love the fact that we have this at the end of that program, you have this ability to go do a phase that's bilateral to see, okay, yeah. how much did those isometrics and that unilateral training, how, how well did that benefit me and see and actually see it expressed in the final phase. So if I had to like narrow it down, those two to me are, are my favorite. Yeah. I mean, I, I love those two. It programs. was for me, map strong. Uh, I did not mm -hmm. expect mm -hmm. th to like that one that much, but when I did it, I, 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 I really built like some quality muscle from that. But now it's MAPS 15. Uh, yeah, it's uh, funny. Same. It, that makes sense. You too, Doug? Yeah. So I did not expect, we created MAPS 15 as a way for people to, you know, break up the workouts with limited schedule, still get good results. I hit a PR on deadlifts on that at the age of 43. Um, and every time I follow it, I just feel good and I get stronger and it's so unexpected. It's so unexpected. I do the advanced version, obviously. So I'm, I'm like 20, I, I love that program mm -hmm. too. 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I did not expect it yeah. to be that that kind of effective. I mean, I've been of all the programs I've been training most like that the longest yeah. in the, the last yeah, year the most has, consistent, been, has yeah. been yeah. most like maps 15 than any of the other programs. And, you know, and it, to me, what the lesson of that was, you know, you, and as much as we communicate this on the podcast of, you know, there's a, there's an effective dose, you right. And, and they're the most appropriate. And then there's, there's too much and there's not enough. And as fitness enthusiasts, I think we always tend to lean towards, the, the most we could tolerate. Yeah, the most, the most we could good. tolerate, not yeah. the, the most optimal for us. And I think that was the big lesson of, of MAP 15 is like, man, it, it, especially, you know, remember Arnold's famous for saying he could go into the gym and do one one set and it'd be more effective than somebody. Than your 10 sets. Yeah, than somebody yeah. doing 10 or I forget what the, what he what he analogy. But the point of being is like, man, when you've been lifting for a really long time, uh, not only do you have all the benefits of, of muscle memory, but then you also have the benefits of being able to get the most out of a couple exercises. I just think that we've reached that point. We have all this, all these years and years and years of training. We don't need a ton of volume to elicit any sort of change or response. And you've gotten super effective at, you can go do a squat or a deadlift and get right into that movement and maximize that movement in yep. a handful of sets. And so, I just think that I'm reminded of that when when doing math 15 about man when you've been lifting for a really long time like that that thing is an incredible incredible program. All right, I got a shout out. Uh, so Arnold's son Joseph Baena, this is the son that he had where he had the affair with his you know his uh, I think it was his housekeeper. But anyway, <laughs> it's pretty I mean it's pretty interesting. This kid looks more like Arnold than all the other kids do. And his body looks like Arnold's body. So he's been working out natural. I don't think he's taking any any steroids or anything like that because he looks natural. But his body shape, like the way his pecs are shaped, his arms, his delts, bro, he's got the, he's like, it's like he took almost he's like he took all of Arnold's genetics. So anyway, it's pretty cool. Um, he's got a decent page. Nothing like you're going to learn a ton off, off of it. But if you're an Arnold fan, it's really interesting. So check it out. There's a company called ButcherBox that delivers to your door grass-fed meats, heritage pork, chicken that's raised amazingly, humanely, wild-caught fish, and great prices. And right now, if you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you're going to get three pounds of free-range organic chicken wings for free in every order for an entire year and $20 off. Again, it's butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump. Check it out. All right, back to the show. First question is from Chris Demosthenes. Are partial reps effective and when do they have a place in a workout program? Partial reps are extremely effective when used properly. Okay, so they're not that effective if you use them just as a way to lift more weight. Um, if you're doing it because you can't do a full range of motion squat or press or whatever. Uh, but if you use them to train a particular range of motion that you may have a weakness in. Yeah, from a performance aspect. Yeah, so let's say that you, when you bench press, that you get the bar a half an inch off your chest, then you get stuck. And you know if you could just move it four inches, then you'd be able to press the bar up. Well, you could train in that range of motion where you come all the way down and come up a little bit and come back down and strengthen that part uh, of the range of motion in order to strengthen a weak part of the rep. So that's one effective way. The other effective way, which I'm going to be very careful how I say this because people are going to take this too far, but if you're training and you're utilizing intensity as the main factor to elicit muscle growth, if you're going through a phase, for example, MAPS Anabolic Advanced has this, right? Where there's there are definite judicious, now it's used judiciously, but there are segments where you're trying to go to failure and beyond. Partial reps can be good here as well. What does that mean by beyond? Well, you go to technical failure, meaning, uh oh, I can't do another full rep without bad form. Now I'm going to do two or three half reps to squeeze out just a little bit more. Those are the two main ways I like to use uh, partial. I'm trying to think of an analogy that that encompasses all of these um, novel stimulus, stimuluses that people always ask about. Mm -hmm. Partial reps, cluster sets, pyramid, stacking, giant set. I mean, they're all these are all these tools yeah. They're just um, all interrupters. That, and they all have value. And I'm trying to think, I guess the best analogy I can come up with uh, is like in basketball where you learn 
all these great moves, like a spin move and a behind the back and a, a, a crossover and a between the legs move. And like, those are all, those are all apply in the game. Like there's going to, there, and, and if you practice them and know how to do them well, uh, you can insert those in the game and they be very effective at, at, at the right times. Uh, but you know how ridiculous you would look if you came down the court and every time every move was a move, yeah. right? If it was a yeah. you went between the legs and you went behind the back and then you went and then yeah. like, you were constantly doing that, it would be ridiculous and you wouldn't be very effective at, at the game. Margin for error would increase substantially, right? And and so I think that's kind of similar in in this situation. Like, man, that yeah, they got great value, but but people abuse them they, and they look ridiculous. They constantly are using all these stimuluses and it's like, man, they're the fundamentals are what's going to move the, the needle. Like yeah. your, your standard five by five, you know, of your biggest five lifts and working on good form and technique and tempo. And like, that is like the, the meat mm -hmm. and potatoes of you, like moving the needle when it comes to strength, performance, sculpting your body. Like, like that is you stay there 90% of the time, just getting good at that totally. stuff. And then, you know, you have all these great tools. Now, personally, I like using these novel things when 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 time is a factor or, or it makes sense or like, or I'm limited to equipment. So I'm going to do some of these kind of unique techniques because all I have is dumbbells or all I have is 20 minutes. And so I, I, I utilize a lot of these novel stimuluses that are uh, that increase intensity in the workout. And because I don't do it very often, I get a great response from it versus how I used it as a kid because I too was like fascinated by all these, you know, magazine articles where yeah. I read about a cluster set or I, I read about partial reps. And, and of course, when you read about them, they attach them to some study that says this will elicit this much more change by doing this, or it gets this much more muscle activation. And so we get, we gravitate towards it. Like it's going to make this big difference. And it's like, no, that's not the bulk of your training, your bulk of your training should be the fundamentals. And then every once in a while you the add flair. this. It's yeah. the flair. It's the fun stuff, right? That uh, I think it's, there's value in, in doing things to shake it up and have fun. Um, but it's not something that's like a staple and it's not something that's really like moving the needles much as it's just like, this is kind of interrupting, disrupting what your normal uh, method of operation looks like. And um, you know, in, in terms of that and, and two, for from a um from a performance aspect so like doing a partial squat and things like that it will apply to for a leverage perspective with you're using like a, you know like like seven foot guy like that's yeah. that's squatting down and like you know his full range of like his optimal uh depth in terms of like being able to generate force is the consideration there so it looks different than say somebody that's trying to go like full range of motion ask the grass squat so i mean you can justify it in like certain directions like that but overall like uh you know the majority of people need to like seek out a full range of motion uh exercise yeah there's a bit of a belief too that like uh, and this was more in the nineties. You still see, see, see this somewhat, but uh, in the nineties, this became a thing for a second. And the reason why I fell out of favor is it didn't work, but the belief was that the load on the bar, which created a lot of tension mattered more than the full range of motion. So they said, okay, if you could bench press 150 pounds with the full range of motion, you're better off doing 250 with partial range of motion because of the load and that's going to make it more effective because you're lifting heavier weight. Well, this has been proven false. I will say this though, the one category of people were partial, what would appear to be partial reps in the sense that it's not what would be considered the standard um, full range of motion or what's accepted standard full range of motion. The one category of people were where they could train with lots of partial reps or athletes when it's specifically applied to, what they're working on in training. It, now, if you get a beginner basketball player, you got kids you're working with, full range of motion, full range of motion. You get advanced players. I'm not going to take a, a D1 basketball player and have him work on full range of motion squats. He's going to get more out of training partial, you know, half or quarter squats because that's the strength that he needs to develop in a sport. In fact, full range of motion squats may actually change his recruitment patterns on the court to the point where it takes away from his performance. And you see this sometimes when they post videos of high level athletes doing these half squats yeah. and then all the, the trainers on the internet who have no idea, Oh, that's dumb. That's 
not even a full squat. It's like, okay, you don't understand what they're training for. It's totally different. Next question is from KPM Strength. What are the best books on programming design and the best meal plan resources? All right, let's talk about program design for a second. Now, there's there's some books that are out there that are pretty good. I, you know, Starting Strength with Mark Ripto is pretty good for the, some of the basics. Um, mm. You can look at good mobility stuff like Supple Leopard is pretty good. But I'll tell you what, nothing taught me more about program design than following well-established, effective programs for myself, for my clients, studying and looking at what top Olympic coaches do with their programming, looking at mm -hmm. well-established powerlifting routines like West Side Barbell's approach, yeah, West Side's for example, a great example, looking at traditional bodybuilding routines that are accepted. I learned a lot looking at functional training or athletic training for different sports and what accepted models of training. Like I learned more. It's almost like buying the car and then breaking it down to see how it works. Mm -hmm. I learned way more from that. So where am I getting at? Well, if you're a trainer or a coach and you're training the average person and you want to figure out uh, program design, rather than buying a book and learning all the ins and outs and trying to figure it out and then you got to apply experience, you could literally get three or four staple MAPS programs, follow them with your clients, see how they're written and start to understand why they're written the way they're written and how they work on your clients. You'll get more out of that than trying to go from the bottom up where you're learning all the pieces and whatever. So I loved doing this as a trainer. I loved looking up, how did the Soviets train their Olympic athletes? What's the Bulgarian method? What, uh, you know, how did Arnold work out? How did Mike Menser work out? Um, what's West Side Barbell's right. routine and structure yeah. look like? Like that taught me more about workout programming besides experience than anything else. Yeah. This, the, I mean, the strength world, I think is really good at that. Um, and like juggernaut trains, another example, Chad Wesley Smith, that. Yeah. Man. Good one. But, um, for books, like for me, it was like super training by Mel Sif that, that highlights what Sal is talking about for the, um, Soviet studies and, and to be able to yeah. kind of extract, um, how they program that with their Olympic athletes. And then, you know, what you can, what you can, uh, compile yourself and kind of structure. But <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so much of a, an experience thing over anything. Like totally. this is really not in a book because of the, the fact that every individual provides so many different variables, um, that it's, it's really like a lot of detective work, a lot of asking the right questions plays the biggest factor in how you structure and prescribe uh, a, an effective program. You know, I, I actually got a lot of value. This is one of the few things I think I did get a lot of value from our, the, all the national certifications that I went through. Um, especially like the NASM. Oh, right. The NASM OPT model. I forgot about the OPT model. That's, yeah. a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Their, their OPT model and then their CES, uh, what was it? Was like was, stabilized, but I mean, strength, yeah. yeah, yeah. But they're, yeah, the seven, there's seven, uh, of the OPT. I, but here's the thing though, to your point, cause we had some trainers in here, not recently or just recently and they're asking, and I always get, I get frustrated when I'm talking to our trainers that listen to the show and stuff like that and that don't own the programs. And that's not because the, <laughs> I know I have a bias, right? You're it's our business for you to buy our programs and it support, help support the business. But honestly, when I'm telling that to one person, them buying all of our programs, ain't going to do shit for us or the business that makes a difference either way. It's really like, how, do, how, how do you not do that? Because I learned most of everything. And okay, you, you guys just rattled off four or five, six different books that you you've learned that from. We all have yeah. 20 years plus experience now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, national certifications range you from 800 to $2,000 a pop. And I'm talking about- Sometimes more. I'm talking four or five of those is where I'm saying I got a good chunk of the stuff that I've learned for programming. So I guess you could go out and buy all those things and invest in all those things, or the, our, you could buy every one of our programs for the price of one of those national certifications. And that's what it is. It's literally a, is the, uh, you know, the combined knowledge of all three of us, of all those things that we've read expand and then also experience with clients and then put it into programming and then unpack it. I mean, that's, uh, we, we name the phases, we name the programs, there's avatars that we build uh, around it, who we say they're for, we talk all about them. So you should know like, oh, this fits this demographic. Okay, well, the, let's see what the guys did. Oh, what they did in phase one. Oh, what they do in phase two is like, oh, and then start to piece that together and apply that yourself. I mean, I just think that that's one of the best ways that you could possibly, that's how I'd want to learn at least. Like if I, yeah. if I could go back and there was something like this, 
Um, I then I maybe I wouldn't have had to buy eight national certifications. Maybe I would have bought one or two, and then I would have just had all of your guys' programs and totally. listen, listen to the show. And then I was like, oh, okay, I get this. I get what, what's going you on. Know, here. You know, you also also this sounds silly. I, mean, I guess not. Uh, is to your experience with yourself. Like, fault. Not that this will teach you everything. It won't because everybody's so different. But to experience what it feels like to let's say squat after you deadlift. Right. Not a good idea. Right. But to experience it and be like, oh, mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't program it this way. Or why on paper, some exercises look like they may per create more stress in the body, but in application, that's not the case. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of situations like that where you look at an exercise, oh, this one's compound. It should yeah. provide more stress. And then, and then when you do it, you're like, wait a minute, that's, that's not the experience at all that my This skill is a little too complicated to implement right now. You yes. have to develop their way up to that point to, to be able to perform it correctly. Well, and I, and I feel like the second part of this question is the same thing with the meal plan thing. It's like, uh, well, one, uh, I don't give meal plans. I stopped giving meal plans over 10 years ago yeah. to clients. Yep. Yeah, they're worthless. Um, instead, what I have them do is tell me how they already currently eat. I then assess it. And then I make adjustments and that there's no one plan or one book you can read to figure that out. I mean, that's like, you have to understand nutrition. You have to understand RDAs on macro micronutrients and then understand through trial and error and practice of like, Oh, how do people report when they or are low in fiber? What are some of the common things here? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and what's neat, we do live in a, a chat GBT Google era that you could actually probably Google and journal and take notes on all these things. But a lot of that is just getting in there and and practicing and no one, you know, no two clients are going to be exactly the yeah. same. Even if their goals are the same, if you have two clients, both are women at 35, both want to lose 25 pounds, uh, it, they could be completely different nutritionally. One of them grossly underconsumes protein and is deprived of healthy fats. The other one uh, overconsumes uh, sugar, but gets plenty of fiber and eats plenty of pro like I mean, it could be a, a thousand different yeah. variables in that. And so learning how to write a meal plan to me is not a, a great strategy. Learn, understanding nutrition. Not to mention the adherence, like what you're describing Listen. in terms of those methodologies. Like it's like 99.9% more effective than handing somebody like, here's your most optimal the, way I want you to eat. I want you to eat. The only people, if you're a trainer or coach, the only people you should be writing meal plans for are competitors. People who compete and they get on stage and they have to have everything away. If you're writing meal plans for your average client, you're yeah. doing something wrong. Yeah. That's the bottom line. And even then, even with my competitors, I still assess the diet and still you attack. Still have to yeah, I still well, tackle yeah. the same way. A good resource, okay, though, is uh, your NCI, right? Nutritional Coaching Institute. And they deal a lot with the coaching around nutrition, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I think Precision is another great uh, company out there. I think NCI is better because I think they do a better job of teaching the application. But if you just want the, the heavy knowledge, I think precision is great, but you need to have knowledge around nutrition, not knowledge around building meal plans because they're they're different. Next question is from Hoop Golf eighty nine. What are your thoughts on rhodiola? Rhodiola. Rhodiola. The the Soviets loved rhodiola. So this is one of the first, uh, one of the only, I should say. Sorry, not my first rhodiola. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys. Nice. Right. It's one of the only herbs uh, or botanicals or supplements, natural supplements, that has a lot of data supporting its uh, efficacy. It literally does what it says that it does. All right, so what, what does rhodiola do? Well, it improves mental clarity, athletic performance, in particular stamina and endurance. It, it, it does promote wakefulness. So not like caffeine, but in a way, in, in a slightly uh, similar way to where you do get a little bit of a boost in energy. And it does improve your body's tolerance to stress, which might help you with how your body adapts to exercise in terms of muscle building and fat loss. And there are some studies that point that it may help with, with muscle building uh, and fat loss too. Probably as such a small extent, you won't notice. What you'll mostly notice on rhodiola is faster recovery, lower stress. You're going to feel sharper and you'll have more stamina. It's one of the only, it's like up there with like ashwagandha. It's like one of the only ones up there that, um, cause there's a lot of herbs and stuff out that they, they try to tout for certain things. Rhodiola has got data. It's a lot of data that supports, uh, that isn't it, it the one works. that I don't like though? At too much. You don't like, so like, like me. 
Yeah, because there are some things I think that we've taken that it, it, I haven't had that mm-hmm. effect, but there are some supplements where I, I have taken it in the rhodiola, and I swear it makes me feel bleh. Yeah, that's one of the ones for me. So, like if you pull up, by the way, there's a good website called examine.com if, if you're ever looking to look up a supplement or a compound, and they do compile all the data um, and studies and they, for whatever you're looking up. And it, it's clear, and this is on Examine, which I trust. I trust this site because every time I cross-reference their studies and stuff, they're, they're being, you know, they're, they're good. It's clear that rhodiola increases resilience to stress at both the cellular and systemic levels. The Soviets studied this for their soldiers. That's what they studied this, mm. is to see if it would be something, and they did establish this would be something to give to soldiers to be able to fight better uh, in the cold, in the heat, without as much food, without as much sleep, and without as much water. So it's interesting. Now, I know I just made it sound like super serum or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's not going to turn you into Captain America. But uh, of mm. all the herbs that are out there for exercise performance benefits, this is one of the ones you'll probably feel if you took it. That'll get turned into a commercial for someone. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is from Mason Burnt. What is the average pricing for training per hour? Oh, man, that's uh, where that's in the country. It varies substantially, yeah. right? You know what's interesting about this? I mean, okay, quite your, here's who determines the price of your training. You and the consumer. Yeah. In other words, how much you we want to charge and then how much people are willing to pay. Okay, yeah. so... You know, now that we're done with econ one hundred and one, like, so what do I what do I charge? Like, we're, well, okay, it depends on what your perceived authority is, how much value you've now presented to the person that you're talking to, and of course, you have to calculate in there what you're willing to work for and your circumstances. If you're brand new, if you have no experience, mm-hmm. you're just getting started. You know this. The most valuable thing to you besides money is practice pro- is, is experience it's practice I, I, yeah i mean i have i have strong opinions around co- coaches and trainers that get hung up on this um, like, i'm not going to train for less it's like, right right well, they're yeah. like i want to be yeah. competitive what's yeah. everyone it's like uh if you were entering the market i would i would look around and see what the trainer's pricing and then i would price under that right away and get experience and get experience yeah. mm-hmm. and that's the first goal the first goal is not Hey, I'm going to get rich doing this. Hey, it's like, can I, can I price myself under what others are pricing and do for free and, and get my book filled? Can I get enough people to where I can't take any more people on? That's goal one. Now, goal two is I'm going to get all kinds of practice and and I'm going to learn uh, on all of these people now that I'm coaching up. And then and only then if do I feel confident that like, okay, I've, I've got a lot of hours under my belt now and I'm feeling confident. I'm getting people results and now I'm getting more people that want to come on, but then I don't have any slots. Great. Now the inevitable happen. Clients will fall off. Clients will get the results. Clients will move and spots will yeah. eventually open up or contracts will be due for renewal. Now I start moving my prices up. Now, every person coming on after that is higher than what the one was before. And I'm just going to keep moving that up as I feel more and more confident in my abilities. And so, but too many trainers get worried about what they should price themselves on. And what they should be most worried about is getting to 10,000 hours because it literally is going to take you close to that before you even truly think you're that experience good. is more valuable. And that's than a long day. time. That's yeah. a long time of working to get to 10,000 hours. So worrying about how competitive your pricing is right now, early on, you're just, you're way ahead of yourself. Yeah. Like go prove. And, and by the way, that same philosophy applied with what we did here. It's not like we sat down and go like, hey, what should we sell maps programs for? Or how much should we charge for advertising? Like when we were starting the podcast. No, you know what we did? Let's go prove somebody wants to listen to this. Yeah. Let's go prove. If they don't want to listen for free, they ain't going to listen Exactly. Let's go prove that we have enough free, valuable content that we can attract potentially thousands or maybe even millions of people to listen to us. Then we'll start worrying about how much to charge. Got to go earn that authority. Yes. And, And that's the thing is really... Because this is such a people um, will will go to who they their friend recommends. Like you build a reputation um, when you're starting out, and so to be more professional and to be 
um, the one that's taking it the most serious is your career is the, is the focus. That's like, and as many people as I can get in to practice and improve and, and create like, uh, systems and, uh, figure all this stuff out where I'm in such high demand that now I'm just yeah. naturally, it'll show itself to you. Like I got to raise rates just in order to fit you in. Uh, and to limit the volume that I have. Yeah, to give an example, like, so you might, you know, people are like, I want examples. I, okay, I trained in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. So already things are more expensive here. So people expect to pay more. Rent is more expensive, et cetera. I also had a studio in Los Gatos, which is a small suburb that is a more affluent suburb. So people, you know, typically will spend even more there, whatever. Um, and this was uh, 12, 10, 10 years ago the last time I trained people. So we're talking 10 years ago. And at, at that point, I had already had a lot of experience. I'd already trained people for, you know, over, you know, one and a half decades, like 15 years at that point. I'd already had lots of experience. I knew what I was doing. I'd built a good reputation. My top per session rate was $150 uh, back then, just to give people an example of what, what that would look like. Um, but, you know, it depends on the area and all that stuff and what people will give you. Here's a good thing if you're a trainer, good, good thing to pay attention to. If this one always, this is a very common mistake that trainers will make. If your books are so full and you have a wait list, that is a sign that you're charging too little. That means your value is so high versus your price that you have people waiting to get on your books and you already trained too many people. Raise your prices. Yeah. Raise your prices to the, where you don't have a wait. If you have a wait list, mm -hmm. you're charging too little, you're, 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 you're short changing. But that's yourself. a good goal to try and get to that. Yes. Like that's what most trainers should be striving to get at is can I get to a place where I've got a wait list and then then you have now, a lot more. Now I'll say this for the consumer, someone listening, how much should I pay for a trainer? You you need to forget the pay for a second. What do you want out of it? Do you want just someone to exercise you? Well, then just find the cheapest guy or girl. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get results that last forever? Do you want to have someone train you and guide you in a way to where you can really figure this out, figure out your body. They train you properly. You don't get hurt. You feel good. It doesn't feel like you're yeah. surviving your workouts. It feels like you're thriving. That they sticks and it lasts. They, yeah, they're creating an environment where you want to show up. This is You're starting to develop and build this relationship with exercise. You're like, you know what? I think I finally have found a way to do this for the rest of my life. And I feel good. And things are changing. And it's sustainable and great. If you find that, then the most expensive trainer in your area, whatever they charge is worth it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you spend, if you spend five, imagine, imagine if you could guarantee yourself that. If you're listening right now and you want those things for yourself. And I told you, it'll cost, and, and guaranteed, if I, if I had a magic wand, I said, guaranteed, I'll wave, wave this wand. And all the things I just said will happen to you. How much would you spend on that? I bet you it's a lot more than what most trainers would charge. So as a consumer, don't get, don't, don't be screwed up by the perception of what people charge. Well, that sounds too expensive. Whatever. If it works, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. If it works, it's worth it because there's yeah. there's great trainers Buy out into there. into the experience. That, and as good as there's good trainers out there, there's ones that are really, really bad as well that mm -hmm. aren't worth, uh, it's not even worth paying them to train you. That's what I'm trying to say. Look, if you love the show, especially if you're a coach or trainer, here's what you got to do. January 15th, I'm doing a three-day training for trainers and coaches. For three days, I'm teaching trainers and coaches how to become better and more successful. You can sign up for it at mindpumptrainer.com and it's free, totally free. Go check it out. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam.